This morning's sermon is from the Old Testament. I'm reading, for, I'm preaching from 1 Kings chapters 19, verses 1 through 21. This is a very interesting story about a prophet, Eli, about the prophet Elijah. And I'm going to use my son's name sign, Elijah, for him, okay? So this is, when I sign this, you know I'm not talking about my son. I'm speaking of the prophet. So you know today, church, we are speaking in what seems to be a new language and a new culture. Sometimes I feel like I'm preaching in a foreign place. Don't you feel that way? This new language and this new culture is trying to teach us that we are all equal. And that means every nation, every race, everyone, everywhere. And this new language and this new culture can make some of us feel uncomfortable. But we have to teach all forgiveness. We have to forgive those who hurt us. We need to instruct people that no one is better than anyone else. No one is superior to anyone else. We're trying to educate folks about equity in our country. This seems like a new lesson to us, and it can make some of us uncomfortable when we hear these lessons. Is that correct? Sometimes it feels unnatural. But we hear from the word of God, and God tells us to love our enemy. And our reaction as humans is, what? That sounds like a real foreign idea. And we wonder why we are being taught that. However, this is the language of Jesus and the culture of Jesus, and we need to learn how to take in the words of Jesus. No matter how busy we are in our lives and in our world, Jesus calls us to take time out, to pause, and to attend to what God is telling us. Have you ever seen that word, you know, that term changing blindness? Well, it's kind of a fascinating thing. Scientists have been studying blindness. And so, this is a sociological study. It's called change blindness. Anyway, I'm going to tell you the story. There was an experiment done by a sociologist showing how people are just blind to their environment because our minds are so busy and preoccupied with things that we don't even recognize changes in our immediate environment. One sociolog sociological study showed, this, was, this one really fascinated me. It showed that one man had another man approach him and, and he was kind of doing a little research on him. And this, uh, the second man asked him how to find a specific address. So the first man started looking to find the address and then started explaining to the man how to get where he needed to go and where he needed to drive and all that kind of stuff to get to the address that he'd asked about. Well, and then three other guys were carrying a wooden placard and they carried it in between in between the two people that were having the conversation about the directions and as they the people the people who were in conversation could not see each other the man who had asked for directions, left, and a different man took his place. Well, the respondent kept speaking, and once the placard was out of the way, he just kept talking and didn't even recognize that, there, that he was talking to a different person. 
he just kept giving his directions, you know, take a right here and a left there and you'll get where you need to go. Even though he was speaking to a completely different individual, this guy had a hat on, he had different colored hair, he dressed differently. And one time they did this experience or experiment and switched out a male for a female. And the respondent still didn't notice. The guy just went on giving directions and didn't even notice that he was talking to a woman this time instead of a man. So the point is pretty astounding. Our minds are so busy and preoccupied 24 seven. Some of us can't even sleep at night because our thoughts are just running rampant and we have a lot of internal chatter, right? It's unfortunate and it's sad. You know, our environment can change right in front of us and we don't even recognize it. Our brains try to take in what's significant and then screen out what's insignificant. And if we are that busy every single day with our internal checklists, you know, we have to take the kids to school. We have to make sure they get their homework done. We have to make sure they catch up on their homework. We have to figure out retirement plans because, you know, retirement planning takes a lot of work. You have to do wills and trusts and all this other stuff. And so we are just busy, busy, busy. So within that busyness, what can force us to stop, to be still, and to attend to what God has to tell us? It's hard, right? You know, many times there are Bible verses that will tell us a clause, and then it will put in the conjunction, but, and then continue. And this little three little word, B-U-T, is a wake up call for us. It'll tell us one thing, blah, 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 but, and then go on to give us the significant points of the lesson. And what happens after the but is what we need to take really um, pay attention to. And in Matthew, he says, well, you will see an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you, do not resist evil. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn the other. That was Jesus' teaching us. You saw what they said, you know, you've heard, blah, 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 blah. But, which means that his teaching following that will have more strength than all that led up to it. In Hebrew, there's a word that I just love. I just love this word. And I hope you fall in love with this word, too. The word is H-I-N-N-E-H. -N -N -E and in the Old Testament, hine is found 1,000 times. Let me say that again. Well, actually, over 1,000 times. They use the word H-I-N-N-E-H, -N -N -E hine. It shows up repeatedly. And it's hard to translate into English. However, it means behold or look. You know, in deaf culture, it means that we're looking at different places. You know, we, we use that sign a lot, right? Look, 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 look over there. Look over there, right? We do that or look at me. We always tell our children, turn your eyes to me so you can sign to them. Well, that word is critical. That word is, when you see the word hine, it, it's found throughout the Bible. And we know that the Bible is God's word, but God also knows that we are going to have all this internal chatter. You know, that doesn't just happen in our era. That's been true throughout history, through the time of Adam and Eve, that internal chatter has been going on. So we need this word henna, which has been put in over a thousand times so that when we're reading, we know that henna means look and pay attention to what comes next. And whenever we see that term, 
we need to be really cognizant because it means God has something important to tell us. That's a beautiful learn word. In Genesis chapter one, verse three, it says, God saw that everything that God had created and behold, it was very good. Isn't that cool? In Exodus chapter 3, verse 2, it says, The angel of the Lord appeared in the fire, and Moses in the burning bush, and Moses looked, and the fire did not consume the bush. So that again was an example of Hineh. In Kings chapter 4, it says, A widow came to Elijah and told him, my son is ill. Elijah went with her, entered her house, and look, the boy was lying dead on the bed. So you see how that word works? It calls our attention to the most salient points. That word is a wake-up call for our attention. And we, God knows we need help. So we have so many tasks that preoccupy our minds. We get so caught up in our own busyness. But it's kind of sad because Bible translators who have worked on translating Hebrew to English Throughout that term, hine. In this morning, when uh, John was reading, Jeremiah should have had that translation of the word hine in there, but it was not inserted. It was just omitted. In my readings, there's supposed to be several times that hine is used, or look, or behold, but it has been deleted every time. Pretty much. And I think that's unfortunate because I need that word, right? We need that word. We need that word to kind of say, hey, wake up and pay attention. Look. God needs us to turn our attention to God because God's got something really important to say to us. Even in the middle of a pandemic, you know, when the pandemic first began, People were just like binging on Netflix, right? Mindlessly binging, isolated, sheltering at home. That was not a smart use of our time. But then we figured out how to get busy again. We all did. You know, to tell you the truth, I think I'm busier now than I was before the pandemic. And how the heck did that happen? You know, I thought that I'd already maxed out my busyness, but I haven't. I bet you've done the same thing, but we're pretty smart. You know, when we get downtime and we have to stay home for months at a time or even just weeks, we get tired of TV. And so we get busy occupying ourselves with, with whatever tasks we can find to do again, right? So in 1 Kings chapter 19, this is a pretty cool story. The prophet Elijah is faced is facing uh, the king and queen of the northern kingdom. This is Ahab and Jezebel. They were they uh, worshipped Baal, who was a false god. They ordered the genocide of the prophets of our god. And so Elijah had just killed their prophets. And Jezebel was furious. And she told Elijah, I am going to kill you. And so he freaked out and he fled. He fled 100 miles until he got into the desert. And he was fleeing through the desert and just finally was exhausted and sat underneath a tree. 
he wanted to die. He truly wanted to die. Elijah was so depressed. He just cried out to God and said, enough is enough. I obeyed you. I took your word to, to those folks who were worshiping idols. And I risked my life. What have you given me in exchange for that? Huh? I am exhausted. I am worn out. And you have been silent. Where are you? I have prayed and you have an not answered me. Come on, I am just fed up. Elijah was so angry with God. Because Elijah was waiting for God to tell him what to do next. And at the same time, Jezebel was threatening to kill him. He was terrified. So he was asking God, why had, he been, why had he asked him to do all this stuff? His life was in danger. He was pleading with God, asking him, where are you? Do you feel that way sometimes? I know I do. Sometimes I feel as if God doesn't care, as if God doesn't care if we're experiencing horrible illness. If God doesn't care that our spouse has passed. Sometimes we feel like God just doesn't care, doesn't care that we're in the middle of a pandemic. We feel like God doesn't care that our uh, people have died. Sometimes we are the ones asking, God, where are you? We have heard nothing from you. We feel like you are not here. Where are you to comfort me? Where are you to comfort us? We're grieving. We're despondent. We can't even get out of bed. God, I am so very, very downhearted. Where are you? Don't we feel like that sometimes? I know I do. This morning, it says that Elijah got up and decided that he was going to go to the Mount of Mount Horeb. Wherever you see the word Horeb, it means Sinai. It's the same mountain. And there's a picture of it right behind me. That's a photograph of Sinai in Egypt. It was or a great photograph of Sinai. Can you see this photograph behind me all right? That is where Moses or that's where Elijah went to. Then that's where Moses went and saw the burning bush. That's where Moses received the Ten Commandments. Moses went into a cave there and got, when God passed by, that's the mountain where this happened. Isn't that awesome? Anyway, Elijah decided that I am going to go to Mount Horeb, to that mountain. Because as that is the mountain where people encounter God. And sure enough, he went into the cave, thinking that he was in the same cave that Moses had been in. And where Moses had been hidden. And he said, I will stay until God speaks to me. So Elijah went into the, went, climbed the mountain, went into the cave and waited. He wanted God to speak directly to him. Do you feel like that sometimes? Do you ever think, okay, I'm going to go back and do this differently. I'm going back to my old ways because God is obviously not talking to me. So I'm just going to go back to what I know, to what's familiar to my old way of doing things, because God has not spoken to me. You know, we want to hear from God. And when we do, we feel spiritually uplifted. We feel the presence of God. We feel a strong connection. But sometimes we feel so disconnected and far away, and we feel nothing in our spirits. 
And that's puzzling to us. But that doesn't happen just to us. This happened to Elijah. Elijah, a major prophet of the Old Testament, felt the exact same way that we do. Can you imagine that? So this doesn't apply just to us or just to you here in 2020 and 2021. This is an age old condition. And probably we're not doing something right. And it's truly a mystery of God. The mystery is what are we supposed to do to be able to hear God? So Elijah went to the mountain, but it didn't turn out the way Elijah thought things would. He went to the mountain, he came into the cave, and he waited. And then the wind came up. And then the verse was, the word was henna. Look, Elijah looked, turned his voice or turned his head and looked as he heard a voice say, Elijah, come out. God will pass by. And Elijah was like, what the heck? I just heard God's voice. And Elijah was absolutely thrilled that God was ready to speak to him. So again, he went out of the cave and the wind was a powerful gale, so powerful that the rock split in two. That's a strong wind, but there was no voice of the Lord. And Elijah was puzzled and said, I'm here. Where are you? God is not speaking. Then the Bible goes on to say that God did was within the wind. And so then an earthquake happened. And Elijah was looking around trying to find God. Because biblically, it says that God will appear at times of earthquake. And once again, Elijah did not see God. And then a fire started to rage. And he thought for sure that, that God would show up because he showed up to the, in the burning bush to Moses. And he led the Israelites through the desert with a pillar of fire when they were in their 40-year journey. So Elijah knew that God was coming soon. Here's this fire going. But then the fire went out and he did not have the voice of God. And Elijah thought, I'm doing this right. I am on the holy mountain. I went into the cave. God is supposed to appear to me there. The, the wind came. There was an earthquake and there was a raging fire, but there was no God. And Elijah was just pondering this. So, and it made him be quiet in his puzzlement. And it said that Elijah entered into sheer silence. I love that term, sheer silence. That means complete silence. His brain that was preoccupied with coming up to the mountain, coming into the cave, the wind, the earthquake, the fire, screaming out for God was totally completely quelled. You know, even if you're deaf or hard of hearing, you know what I'm talking about. Your mind is not quiet. But when that mind becomes silent and there's no one around us and our thoughts are stilled, that is an experience of sheer silence. You hear about different monks Oh, I love to study monks. They're amazing. Monks realize that they cannot come into the presence of God. And so a lot of time by living within the world. So a lot of time they live into, in a monastery. There's one in Kansas City, Missouri. And they stay there to learn how to totally enter into silence how to totally clear their minds so that they can listen to the voice of God. It's not an auditory voice. It's a mental and a heart 
touching voice. Many times when we're feeling low and down and times when we are truly entering into depression and feeling absolutely alone, if we can become quiet, then we hear God speaking to us. So God told Elijah, guess what God said? He said, God did come to the mountain and said, Elijah, what are you doing here? God says the same thing to us, right? We don't listen to God, so we go back to our familiar ways. We go back to our old habits. Maybe we start drinking again. Maybe we get sink back into our addictions instead of looking for other ways to find God. Or we become emotional. We get enraged with our spouse and our children. And when we're preoccupied with that, we cannot hear what God has to say to us. And so what God says is, hey, folks, what are you doing? We know that everything will be okay. We know that. We know better. But still, our minds will be consumed with worry. We'll become over anxious. We'll freak out. We'll have panic attacks. Because we want to see God where we want to see God. We want to see God right here and right now in this very place. We want to see God in the place that we decide that we want to see God. And when that happens, we miss God right standing right in front of us. Or right, be, God has come right past us and is trying to speak to our minds and our hearts. And we often miss that experience because we are expecting to see God in other places and other times. So we, like a monk, we don't know how to clear our minds like the monks do. We think it's better to worry and better to think and better to stay awake all night dwelling on whatever it is that we're re um, obsessed with. We ruminate on things. We think about this. We think about that. And we just dwell. We don't offer forgiveness. We just dwell. And then worries make their way into our brains and we just are obsessed with them. We think, well, my husband did this. My kids did that. And we just start to dwell on it. We are not in the right place to listen to God because God is right here in front of us and speaking. We just need to listen. And that's God. God will bring God's word to us in a new way. And God will say, Hina, look. I'm speaking to you right now. Stop. Be still. Enter into sheer silence. Clear your minds and listen. Put your worries aside. Put your ruminations aside. Forget the past. Forget what's happening around you in this moment. Forget about future worries. Just be still. Enter into sheer silence. God says, hey, look, Hine, I am speaking to you now. And we have to figure out how we can notice all of those henna experiences. Because those are wake-up calls. We get called back to look. When we're going nuts, we get called to look. When we're anxious, God says, look. 
when we're having insomnia because of our worries, God is calling us to look. In the middle of our arguments, God is beckoning us to look. God says, hey, look. And God is calling out to us constantly, telling us to look. But you have to figure out how you can enter into that complete and sheer silence. And then listen. Listen. Whew. But I need to caution you. A lot of folks in the world will use that word inappropriately and say, hey, look, look at me. But those folks are just self-serving. People who are using henna in that way don't want to see you change. They do not want to see you heal. They don't want to see you improve your lot. They will tell you, it's okay for you to stay just the way you are. They'll tell you, well, things happen in the world and it's okay. You know, just think about it. Things are better now than it was before. Things around here aren't that bad. And those kind of folks will try very hard to get your attention. But don't look. Or they will tell you, hey, look, you don't need to forgive that person over there. They'll say, hey, look, you don't need to go to church. Look, you don't need to read the Bible. You're deaf. You don't need to mess with English. You don't need to love those folks over there. They're just disgusting. They'll say, don't fight for those folks who don't have any voice. Let them pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. They've done whatever they deserve their lot. They will beckon your attention and they will tell you things that you should not be doing. And we have to work very hard to fight against those messages. Because the only one who really deserves our attention and deserves to use that word of look is God. The worldly voices that you see are very, very loud and they do command our attention and we tend to attend to them instead of God. Think about Adam and Eve. They looked at the Satan. They attended to the wrong voice, right? The voice of the Satan was more intriguing, more interesting. And so Eve attended and then Adam looked. So think, where are we? You know, all of us, not just Adam and Eve, tend to get captivated by those voices. We all do. And as we hear God's voice, know that it will be still. The world's voice is loud. So we need to train ourselves just as the monks do. We need to train ourselves how to block out and attend to that still, small voice that is the voice of God. If it's a loud, cacophonous voice, we need to push those aside and attend only to the voice of my creator, of the creator who created each and every one of us, who created you and created me. Our God who loved us so much that God sent God's only son into this world. That's astounding. That's how much God loved us, loves us. God wants the absolute best for us. Most of the worldly voices don't. And God also knows what's best for us. God knows how to guide us into the right paths. God wants our life to be happy and smooth and full of peace and wonderful. 
but we keep turning our eyes to those in the world and following the worldly ways instead of God. Even though God is standing right in front of us, right this moment, speaking to us. But we often don't see it if our minds are too preoccupied. We need to bring them in to sheer silence. Amen? Amen and amen. We need to do whatever it is that we need to do to find that place of silence. Practice, work on it, pray, take time to be totally alone. Take time to be totally alone. I want to say that again. Let me turn the recording off. <laughs>